Hmm? Whoa! Yeah. If there's a way around, I'm going to go towards... I don't even want to look at it or not. I want to handle it. I want to do something with it. Shape it. Build it. I always had to be cutting a piece of wood with a knife, you know, whittling and, and making little bows and arrows. And even right to this day, I still see a piece of wood before I see a piece of candy or anything else, you know? I want to do something with the piece of wood. At the beginning of 1980, Sidney Leeson began building a miniature replica of Britain's famous 18th century flagship, HMS Victory, to be recreated from scratch. The retired Canadian carpenter devoted over 12 years to his dream project, applying a lifetime's worth of experience and appreciation of precision handcrafting like very few others in the world ever could. Presented here in homemade video footage and photography from the early 1990s is Sidney sharing his incredible achievement and personal journey. Ottawa. Yeah, I was born in Ottawa in 1911. My dad and uh, my mother landed in uh, Montreal, I think, on a Saturday. And I was born on the following Monday. That's how close it was. We'd been at sea two or three more days. I've been born on board ship. I uh, lived most of my life in Ottawa. I spent a couple of years in Toronto and uh, two or three years in England. I went to school in England for a while. I went to school there from the time I was uh, 10 years old to 13, somewhere like that, or nine to 12. My grandfather, of course, took me all over the place, all over England, you know. He took me to Portsmouth to see the, uh, the victory, HMS victory. You know, it's in Dry Dock in Portsmouth in England. And uh, by the time I had a tour of that ship, I was just simply fascinated with what had been done by wood, even though I was just 12 years old. The ship fascinated me. I can remember when it was time to leave the ship, I told my grandfather, can't we stay a little bit longer? I said, let's go back up there, you know, pointing up the gangway. I could have stayed on the ship, I think, a week. I just liked going up the ladders in this up onto the poop deck, you know, and looking at the lanterns and all the work and the, and the steering wheel and the binnacle, you know, with its lanterns in it. The whole thing just fascinated. To say nothing to when a small boy looks up that big mass, you know, that main mass is a big mass. To a small boy, it's going right up to heaven, you know. And I was just fascinated with it. Just fascinated with it. And actually, I never really ever did forget it right to this day. It's as fresh in my memory as if I just come off the ship this morning. Yeah. It wasn't until I was getting close to retirement that I started to think, you know, uh, hey, there's going to be a big change in my lifestyle here. I'll have to give some thought to what I'm going to do. Otherwise, you sit in a chair and just go resting, eh? That won't do. Uh, providing you have your health, of course, which is the number one requisite. I wasn't retired very long before uh, I decided, you know, this is what, it's, what the project's going to be. I'm going to construct a model of HMS Victory to the best of my woodwork to build. And that's what I decided to do.
I get at this just about the same way as a man would that was going to build a boat. The same number of parts in the keel as the real ship, etc., etc., all the way up to the top of the main mast. The first thing you have to do is research the project. Not just pictures of her, but the anatomy of the ship itself. I decided to go right to the horse's mouth. In other words, get it from Portsmouth, my brother in England. He gathered up a considerable amount of uh, sketches, drawings, and photographs of the ship. And that plus uh, friends and in-laws in England go down to Portsmouth and gather onboard photographs and uh, other drawings that were available and ship them over to me. So I spent about a year collecting all this and reading it and studying it until I understood where, how the various ship's parts went together, their purpose, etc., etc. When I thought I had a really good understanding of the ship, I then had to decide what size I would build the ship. In other words, choose a scale for the model. Choosing a scale was controlled really by, I guess, mostly two things. One is realizing that it had to be mobile when it was finished. If I built it too large, it would be a very difficult thing to move around. If I built it too small, it would force me to leave out some of the detail because the small parts would become wiped right off the scale, you see? After measuring the small parts of the ship, the tiniest pieces I could find, the little jewel blocks in the rigging become very tiny when one considers that they have a pulley wheel within the two cheeks of the block and it gets down to the size of a lead pencil, the thickness of a lead pencil, because it's very difficult to make. So I had to up the scale until I got to a point where I figured I could make a jewel block. Now, instead of going ahead and drawing plans to that size, I decided to make one first. Still no drawings or anything. So I made myself a jewel block as small as I could. When I did that, I found I could make it right down to a, to a 64th. That is 164 scale. So I chose that as the scale of my ship. I tried with everything I had to hold on to the scale, using calipers, you know, to work to thousands of an inch, etc., to hold the scale real tight. Now, having decided on a scale, I then decided to draw all the plans I would need, or at least most of them, I would need to build the ship. So my drafting experience uh, came in real handy here because I could just naturally go to the drafting board and do it. And uh, this took about a year and a half, I guess, to uh, take off from all the drawings and photographs I had because all my drawings and blueprints and everything that I had gathered from overseas were not all the same scale. Uh, one sheet I got from overseas, I might find another one, a different scale altogether, so I had producers always in my own scale. So finally I came up with all the parts that I intended to build. Now after I started drawing the plans, that is I got an elevation, a profile, I then realized I had to stop again and do some more thinking. Look at the ship, decide what I was actually going to make and what was no purpose in making because it would be out of sight. And uh, having done that, I then do the drawings of the parts that I was going to include in the model. Deciding what to include on his model from the hundreds of thousands of parts on the world's oldest warship took much more consideration than simply what meets the eye. This brings you to a, a decision you must make. You ask yourself, obviously, the question, how do I know what to put inside and, and what not to bother putting inside? As soon as it's in a position where you cannot see it by any, any method at all, except to open the ship up, then, of course, there's no point in building it. So this is how I determined what I would build inside. Uh, for instance, let's just take the, the stern galleries. Anything when I looked through the windows that I could not see because it was on the other side of a closed door, I just built the closed door. But in my case, because it was also at the upper deck level, I realized that if I left the doors open at the cabin's quarters, when I looked through the stern, 
windows. I'd be able to see right straight down, right all the way down to the front of the ship by looking through the captain's windows. Now, another example of, you notice on the side of this particular model that I've closed most of the gun ports. Now, this was a decision that was made after a considerable amount of thought. Down there, at that level, you could never get inside again to repair anything or to clean it. You just simply could not service it in there. So I decided to close these gun ports down here and open the ones where you can still get at the gun from the, still get at the guns, you see, from the inside. All the inside, lower hull of this ship's all been sprayed to try to protect it, uh, if, you know, from microorganisms eating, eating into the wood. It's also all varnished on the inside too, it, again, to try to keep, uh, hold down the, uh, the dampness, say, keep it so that the wood can't, can't take up the damp atmosphere. Because of the, uh, the scale, there's quite a few jobs in the model as you go along that you find that there isn't a hardware store tool that's suitable. One of these would be drilling very, very small holes. Because piano wire came in all these gauges, I realized that if a pointed piece of piano wire would drill, which I knew it would, the bit can be very short, just long enough that it will go through the thickness of material you have to drill. You couldn't have the bit an inch long and be drilling a hole through something an eighth of an inch thick and, and the piano wire fine like a hair on your head. It would just go hooly hooly hooly, eh? So you make them short. Uh, most of my cutting tools were made from nail files. I nailed it to soften the, to soften the file, cut the piece I want, bend it to the shapes I want. If I want to reach around in a corner, I made one that would go around in a corner and I could see like that, you see, and the chisel was going right around the corner like this with a little wee end on it, sixteenth of an inch, sharpened to a bevel. Then I hardened it, eh? Tempered it so it would be hard enough to cut the wood. By the way, this is another thing which uh, a woodworker knows, but a beginner might not. One cut, one rub on the oilstone. One cut, one rub on the oilstone. Now this means that the tools have to be sharp, like uh, like a surgeon would need a scalpel. It has to be sharp so that he doesn't have to go like this, that he can just touch it and it cuts, okay? Now that's the trick with these homemade tools or any other tool. When you come to do fine work, they must be razor sharp all the time. Now a good set of, uh, of special files is a big help, which would be a set of riffler files, a big help. There wasn't a case where I had a problem with a saw. Uh, some very small saws are available, as you know, in uh, modeling shops, and they're quite adequate for what you have to do. Problem-solving skills are very necessary when building scratch models, and determining the order of what parts to put on and how to do that is essentially a job all on its own. When we look at the model uh, finished, uh, we don't realize on all the, uh, the holding that went on in order to create the finished product. Because there was so much work from the keel to the waterline. You can see that if it was held by props or something, it, you wouldn't be able to, to work underneath there. So what I built it upside down, I turned all the frames upside down fastened them on a, on a very straight working board. Then I planked it all and finished it. Then I turned it the right way up and mounted it in, a, in two little uh, curved holders, jigs, to hold the ship while I built the rest of the ship from there up. Now, in making individual parts, you run into the same problem. You can see that throughout a, a model of this type, there's quite a few individual holders were made to hold parts so that you could work with your two hands over here on your workbench before you put it on the ship. Which raises another question, just putting it on the ship. 
Matter of fact, it starts right in the beginning. Just when you go to start work, you suddenly realize that if I ever get B on before A is finished, I'll never be able to get back to A. Now, this journey starts from working inside out. In other words, not get the model done up and then find I had still had a gun or a plank or a set of stairs or something to put away down inside. They had to be done before the sides were closed up. I guess another topic that we should raise is adhesives. In some cases, you want glue that is uh, somewhat flexible, that is, it doesn't dry too glassy, too hard and brittle. In other cases, you want glue that it doesn't matter if it dries hard as long as it's super strong. The other thing about glues is you need different drying times. So like when I was doing planking, I used a, a glue which was took pretty near 24 hours to really cure. It had a working time of about 12. When I wanted about three or four hours working time, I've used six or 12 hours in the glue. This is constructed in fancy hardwoods and instead of being constructed and then painted, which was purely my own choice. I wanted this red coppery color, color at the bottom that is below the waterline, so I, I chose uh, this Bubinga from West Africa. But above the waterline, because the real ship is painted in black and ochre stripes, after thinking over lots of woods, I decided to use walnut and cherry alternative, you see, in longitude and stripes. The walnut and cherry in, on this ship are English. When it comes to decks, I wanted wood that would be attractive and durable, something that looked nice in combination with the other woods, and I chose teak for this. This teak is uh, from Burma. And then when I come to masts and spars, apart from its color, it had to be a wood that would stay very straight. So I chose lance wood. It's the wood that pool cues are made of. The tops, that is those platforms that you see there, I built those of uh, boxwood. Plank the inside with, with the same as the decks, the teak. Then we come to all the fancy work where ships of this period had a lot of carved work, you know, like the figurehead on the bow and all the fancy work on the stern. Because the carvings are so small and so intricate, you have to choose a wood that won't crack or split easily. And for that reason, I chose boxwood. As far as the anchors were concerned, uh, I chose brass to make the shafts and the palms and which are on the real ship are oak, but I used uh, birch, cool yellow birch. That's where this ship is really differs from the original, is in the choice of woods. The original built primarily of oak. This one, by my own choosing, for better or for worse, is in fancy hardwoods. Although Sidney did keep many records about his replica, the sheer volume of trial and error moments made it difficult to track everything. However, when asked about the total length of rigging, he gave his best guess, approximately two kilometers. The real challenge came to rig it anywhere near like the original. I soon found out that it's going to take a tremendous amount of work. When I say rigging, I mean the, the mass, the spars, all the blocks that are used in the tackle, the dead eyes you see along the channels here at the bottom of the shrouds, and all the rattlings, and the gear blocks, and the platforms, and the compression posts, and the caps, and boot and pendants, etc. You can go on like this right up to the top, or up to the front of the flying jibbon, or right to the tail end of the, of the gaff. The driver boom even farther still. Another intriguing thing was I soon found that when, I, when, I did, when it came time for rope, I realized that there was no way I would be able to purchase any string or cordage of any kind, you know, that would represent the rope at this particular scale. So of course this meant that you have 
to make the rope. To that end, you have to invent yourself a little machine to twist the rope up because you need ropes of uh, several different diameters. You need them in two different colors. That is the beige color to represent the rope that was hemp on a real ship. And the black to represent the rope that would be tarred. And you can see the tarred rope is used mostly for standing rigging, that is rigging which holds other parts together or prevents them from falling. It's not adjusted day in and day out all the time. It's permanently fixed until it's damaged. Now all the beige colored rope, it's known as running rigging because it's operating. It's used to uh, hoist sails, to hoist yard arms up and down masts. It's used to turn the yards at various angles to the wind. The other thing that's needed in regard to the ropes is that no matter where they start or what course they take, they have to have a place to be belayed that is tied down. So the belaying plan alone is quite a problem in itself. The only uh, ropes missing are those which would be attached actually to the sail cloth itself, which would be um, the bow lines and the bunt links and things like that. But all the other ropes uh, of any importance are on the, on the model. I must have turned out a couple of hundred gun barrels, even though I only chose about half of them, you know, for the ship. Made a whole bunch of them, then paired them up and chose the ones I thought were closest to the real thing. Believe it or not, one of the toughest problems on this ship were those three lanterns and the one up in the after edge of the main platform. Now, the three at the stern, they all suffered from the same problem. One is that they're not round, they're eight-sided, they're octagon. The other is, as you can see from looking at them, that they're tapered. They're wider at the top than they are at the bottom. The taper isn't constant on a vertical line. That is, it's, it's straight up on one side, and the taper's mostly all on, all on the opposite side. And it's like taking a cone, but pushing it over this way. Uh, however, I did get around it. I made the frames by very fine uh, thread. There the outcome of maybe eight or nine tries. It. I had a whole box full of bits of lanterns when I was done. And there the, <laughs> there the outcome finally. Of course, at the other uh, very, very inviting part to me was the, the carving on the ship. If a modeler is going to uh, do this kind of carving, I would say not from the experience I had, they certainly want to make himself very accurate drawings, precise drawings, right to scale of every piece he's going to have. My first few tries, I'd be almost finished the piece and then I would break it, no matter how careful I was going. I had to find some way to hold these things while I carved them and still be able to put them on the ship without breaking them. So in the end, I glued uh, a, a suitable piece of boxwood onto a, a very thin piece of plywood and I carved its outline. I didn't do any relief work on the carving, just the outline. And of course, the plywood just gave me that extra little strength I needed that didn't break. Of course, I carved everything in reverse. What I did then was I turned it over and glued the uh, boxwood side of the piece onto the ship. When the glue was set, I peeled the plywood off, which was now facing outwards, and I did the relief work while it was on the ship. And that's the way I did it without breaking it. When I come to the figurehead, it was a case of the general conception that I started with, which was a fancy hardwood model. So I did the figurehead as near as I could to the original. As well as seeing the original victory at every turn as a beautiful example of creativity rather than a destructive force of war, when the chance occurred to add a very personal touch to his model, he took it. In the old days, the shipbuilders, the carpenters or woodworkers, or whatever they happened to be, one of their the things they always did for good luck, they claimed, was to put a bottle of 
whiskey or rum or something, build it into the timbers of the ship. Well, of course, you couldn't put a bottle or a rum in a, in a model this size. But uh, I was talking to a lady one day while I was building the ship, and it was only put up to the water line. All the frames were open. And I pointed inside the ship, I said, about years where they used to put a, build in a bottle of whiskey or something for good luck for the ship. But I said, you know, I can't get a bottle of whiskey in there, there's not room. And she says, well, I collect miniatures of all sorts of things. She says, I have a miniature bottle of whiskey. She says, it's only about an inch and a half long. She says, how would you like me to give you that? So she bought me this bottle of whiskey, a 70 proof. I built it in a little box and put it in the hall between two of the, uh, the frames. I think between about the seventh and eighth gun port is down in but there. And then when uh, getting along up onto the deck, when I built the belfry, I needed a bell, of course. I made some little drawings of the bell, and I can, was considered turning one over brass on a lathe. And uh, a very dear friend of mine said, I had a little bell that, remember, you took when, when we were working together, she said. And she says, where is, do you still have it? And so I remembered. So I went looking through all my stuff, and sure enough, I had this little bell. She spent a lot of time in the early stage of this ship helping me with plans. Yeah, I'm glad that's in there for her sake. There's a cabinet just forward of the steering wheel called the binnacle. It's a cabinet with uh, two drawers, uh, but waist high on a man. But underneath, it's a, like a glass case. There's a lantern in the center, and you can see that pipe coming up from the top. It is to exhaust the heat from the lantern. On each side of the lantern is a compass. Now, when it came to making the, the, uh, the lantern, I eventually ended up with the idea of breaking the end off of a thermometer tube and using that as a little glass lantern and building the black parts of the lantern around it. And it made a very good, attractive little lantern. People have said, oh my goodness, I wouldn't have the patience, you see. But uh, I never ever thought about the patience part. I was just too involved in doing it. Uh, I lose my patience over lots of things, but not over that. Having been on board the ship, it helped me because I've always been able to keep the thing in mind while I'm building the model, even though I was very young, my memory's very clear of it. So I can see myself many times while I was constructing this model, building something that I had actually touched on the ship. I've said to myself, gee, you know, I had my hand on that. Now I know her plank by plank, rope by rope, block by block, window by window, carving by carving, etc., etc. So I don't see her the way I, I first saw her. Too. I guess it's probably one of the most worthwhile things I've done in my lifetime. It's given me a lot of pleasure, quite, a, uh, quite an education too. The end result has been satisfactory and that's, uh, that's as much as anyone can ask. So in that sense, I'm very, very happy I didn't waste all those years. Some of it now boggles me uh, now that I look back. Some stuff I did say seven or eight years ago, I can hardly remember how I did. I have to think about the day that I made it, you know. I learned that I could dedicate myself entirely to something, give beyond what I had ever given before. All the other things I've done never required so much concentration. Going to work each day was easy compared to this. Anything I ever tried in my life was easy compared to this. Yeah. As a matter of fact, if you're, if you're thinking of doing it, better give yourself 10 or 11 years to do it. Because that's how long it is. I advise you not to start till you're 70, though. <laughs> Even right, right now, I have just as much interest now on the last piece as I had on the first. Sometimes I wish it wasn't finished. It's so nearly finished. I'd like to be able to work on it longer. You know, that's how much I've enjoyed it. Uh, dedication. Wouldn't have missed it for the world. <laughs> Yeah. 
In October 1995, Sidney donated his model to the Canadian War Museum in Ottawa. One year later, it was designated to be included in the museum's prestigious national collection. I can take a hang a long time. That's you. <laughs> God, look at the perfect, yeah. <laughs>